Hi, my name is Olivia Shiva, and it is September 12, 2019, and this is my Unit 4 Case Connection for Biochemistry, and I will be discussing Cases 1 and Case 3 today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we dive into the first case that talks about urea cycle disorders, let's review briefly the urea cycle and beta oxidation. Um, so the urea cycle is an anabolic process that occurs during both the fed and the fasted state. And this process utilizes multiple different enzymes and it removes excess nitrogen um, from the body and excretes it as urea. So deficiencies in this cycle can lead to elevated ammonia levels as we learned about in the course. And then there's fatty acid beta oxidation. And then this process occurs during the fastest state only. And that's when we have increased glucagon levels and decreased insulin levels, as you might recall. Um, during this process, we have those long chain free fatty acids entering into the liver where they're converted into fatty acid acyl CoA, and then they enter into the mitochondria where our beta oxidation occurs. Um, and that goes through a series of reactions, and ultimately, we end up producing the NADH, FADH2, and acetyl CoA. Um, and if you recall, acetyl CoA is used for ketogenesis, which is another fasted state. Uh, metabolic process, and acetyl-CoA is also an allosteric activator for pyruvate carboxylase, which is an enzyme needed for that very first step in gluconeogenesis. So now that we can have an overview of that, let's go ahead and dive into our um, first case. So let's look at which of the diagnostic tests would be best for distinguishing between a disorder and the urea cycle versus the disorder and the beta oxidation. So our options are A, blood glucose, B, urinary acids, C, serum fatty acids, or D, plasma glutamate, glutamine. Sorry. Um, so the prompt says that there's a newborn girl who developed lethargy, hypothermia, and apnea within the first 24 hours of birth. And then lab results were drawn to determine which metabolic disorder she had. And then it asks which of the listed diagnosis would be best to distinguish between a urea cycle disorder and then the beta oxidation disorder. So um, looking at these options, we can kind of figure out which one is best. So first off, the serum fatty acids, such as like HDL, LDL, or VLDL, those would be beneficial for determining the deficiencies and the fed state pathway of fatty acid synthesis, not fatty acid beta oxidation. So therefore, this option can be eliminated. And then as discussed throughout unit three, um, deficiencies in beta oxidation lead to hypoglycemia as a result of the decreased amount of acetyl-CoA uh, produced during this process. Uh, so ultimately, this decreases the amount of glucose produced through gluconeogenesis. As I mentioned earlier, that we would need that acetyl-CoA to allosterically activate pyruvate carboxylase. Um, so if we didn't have that around, then we wouldn't be able to make as much glucose through gluconeogenesis. So in terms of beta oxidation, the blood glucose levels would probably be a beneficial diagnostic test. Um, however, the urea cycle doesn't really rely on glucose throughout its pathway, so this wouldn't really be the best option for distinguishing between these two disorders. Um, similarly, urinary acids are useful in determining urea cycle deficiency. Uh, for example, erotic or rhotic acid can be measured in the urine and can indicate deficiencies in the urea cycle uh, enzymes, such as ornithine carbonyl transferase or carbonyl phosphate synthetase 1, um, which we talked about this past week or so um, oh, when we discussed the urea cycle. And then Products of beta oxidation are not released through urinary acids. So again, this is kind of similar to the blood glucose. This test of urinary acids wouldn't really be beneficial because it only really talks about um, the urea cycle and not the beta oxidation. Uh, so this kind of leaves us ultimately with plasma glutamine. But we'll look at why this is the case on the next slide. So what's the connection between glutamine, urea cycle, and beta oxidation? Well, this can be seen between um, transamination reactions. So first we have glutamate, which is found in the purple tissues. And then this is transaminated to glutamine via glutamine 
sympatase, and then our normally now formed glutamine is transformed into glutamate via glutaminase, and it also releases this NH4, which enters into the urea cycle. Um, and then our leftover glutamate is then converted into alpha-ketoglutarate via glutamate dehydrogenase. So if you remember previously, um, alpha-ketoglutarate is an intermediate of the TCA cycle, and additionally, the TCA cycle requires acetyl-CoA, which, if you recall from a previous slide, acetyl-CoA is also a product of beta-oxidation. So if we had a deficiency in either beta-oxidation or the urea cycle, we could measure this with plasma glutamine levels. So let's move on um, to the second part of this prompt. So based on the patient's symptoms, it was guessed that she had a urea cycle deficiency. And as you can see here, she had elevated ammonia levels, elevated urine erotic acid levels, and then slightly decreased levels of plasma citrulline. Um, so which enzyme would likely result in this um, and which enzyme would not? So let's look at the urea cycle. Um, so as you can see here, this, this figure outlines the urea cycle in more detail, including the enzymes used. Um, and based on the patient's lab results, um, there's increased urine erotic acid, and this likely results from an, um, a deficiency in ornithine carbamyl transferase, or OTC. And as you can see, OTC combines with ornithine and carbamyl phosphate to form citrulline. Um, a deficiency of this enzyme would lead to increased amounts of ornithine, because we basically are blocking this, this step right here for it to continue to continue throughout the rest of the pathway. Um, so that would cause us to release excess amount of um, erotic acid in the urine. So additionally, a defect in this um, enzyme right here would cause decreased production of citrulline because it's downstream of this enzyme. So we're, again, we're kind of blocking the rest of that, this pathway right here, the rest of the pathway. Um, clinical presentation of OTC deficiency leads to rapid increase in ammonia levels which is also exhibited in the patient's lab results because um, she went from 314 micrograms per deciliter to 600 micrograms to deciliters. Um, so that, again, you know, basically affirms that this would probably be the most likely deficiency, um, deficient enzyme. The enzyme likely uninvolved with the process, though, is carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 right here, um, or CPS1. And this is because it resides upstream of the elevated ornithine levels that we see in the, the urine. If there was a deficiency in CPS1, it would kind of be assumed that there would be decreased levels of urine orthoric acid. So that's why we can, that's because also it's downstream. So again, if we block this step, we wouldn't be making as much ornithine. Um, so that's why this enzyme possibly wouldn't be deficient. So let's move on to case two, um, gout and the effects on skin and skin. So um, this case is concerned with a 47-year-old male, and he presents with pain in his right toe. Ultimately, the patient is diagnosed with gout after laboratory tests were performed. Um, gout is a condition that results from buildup of uric acid as a result of purine synthesis. Um, gout can cause debilitating pain and swelling of the joints, but it usually does resolve about after a week. And before we discuss the best ex explanation of the patient's gout, uh, let's briefly review purine synthesis and salvage. So as discussed in chapter 33, purine synthesis involves the transformation of riboside phosphate from the phosphate pathway into um, phosphoribozoyl pyrophosphate, or PRPP. And then from here, PRPP adds on additional carbon to build the ring structure of our purine. Um, and ultimately, this leads to our intermediate inosine monophosphate, or IMP. Ultimately, IMP is used to produce GMP and AMP. And then a series of steps go on to produce guanosine and adenosine, which goes on to produce our uric acid, which as you can see here. So adenosine goes into inosine, and then hypoxanthine into uric acid, and the same with guanosine. So we go through this process to produce uric acid. So to help reduce the amount of uric acid produced from purine degradation, um, purine salvage pathways are used as seen in this figure right here. Uh, here you can see that the products of purine synthesis, so the bases, are converted back into your nucleotides, and that's using these enzymes right here. 
um, which we'll see just a little bit more in the next slide. So as previously mentioned, gout is caused by buildup of uric acid, and this can be caused by a multitude of reasons, all of which were listed as possible answer choices. So um, either a decrease in urinary excretion of uric acid, the overproduction of purines, or the decreased salvage of uric. But before we can determine which of these is the answer um, or to blame for our patient's gout, it's important to take into consideration the patient's recent switch from diet soda to regular soda, which contains fructose. Um, some studies show that fructose stimulates the production of purines, thereby increasing the amount of uric acid buildup, resulting from purine synthesis. So that's kind of the reason why I'm leaning towards answer choice one as the most reasonable option for our patient developing gout, because I think that he probably has increased purine synthesis occurring from this recent switch from diet to regular soda. However, it's also worth mentioning why the other choices are not consistent with the provided data. So the patient's lab results show increased amounts of plasma urate, but decreased amounts of urinary uric acid. Um, the most well-known disorder associated with decreased purine salvage is leish nyan syndrome. And this disease results from mutation in hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosoyl transferase enzyme, and that leads to neurological deficits and impairment of renal function. So if the patient had impaired renal function, we'd expect this um, to be elevated, his urinary uric acid to be elevated instead of having low levels. Lastly, um, excess alcohol consumption is the main contributor for the under-excretion of uric acid. And this is because alcohol levels, excess alcohol levels produce increased amounts of lactic acid, which um, competes with the uric acid for excretion. So because of this, additional information would be needed um, in regards to the patient's alcohol consumption in order for us to rule this out as a possible cause for his symptoms. So that's all I have. Thank you so much.